All right, so we're moving on with the topic of fluid mechanics. <clears throat> and now I'm going to touch about the very basics of, uh, of terms, and I'm going to explain them thoroughly and make you really understand what's going on. What I'm saying, volumetric flow rate, what do I mean? How does it relate to the cross-section, the speed of flow? And I'm also going to relate it to how our blood flows with respect to these terms. And I'm going to touch on a very sensitive subject, which is the Bernoulli's law. And I promise I'm going to make this thing make sense. So let's get started. And first of all, really what we need to define is what is volumetric flow rate? Because when I have a fluid going, going through here, really, I can't only address the speed. Let's just say this fluid is doing 20 kilometers, kilometers per hour. So really, I can't... I need to know how much fluid is being displaced here, or if I, if I wait for two seconds, how much fluid is going through this point. So really volumetric flow rate is my way to assess how much fluid is going through a given point, and that's really what it means. It's the, let's just say it's the volume, volume of fluid, of fluid that is being displaced that is, that is being displaced, or let's say that moves through, moves through a unit cross section, cross section per unit time. And this is really my way of asking how much fluid is, is going through this point. So really when I'm saying in my other example before, if I had a faucet here, and I had the nozzle here, and I turned it, and I and I'm going to let's just say I have a little bit of a a little bit of a flow, a laminar flow here going on. And if I turn this faucet, I'm going to experience maybe maybe more flow. So I increase the volumetric flow. It, it is it is true that I also increase the speed of the flow, but really by turning this nozzle here, I increase the volumetric flow rate. And the cross section at this point is really this. This is the cross section here, this point here, this is the cross section per unit time. And really what's important to understand here is that when we split laminar flow and we go from laminar, from laminar flow to turbulent flow, turbulent, something happens between this relationship. So let's, let's try and understand. And I'm going to show you a graph that you may have seen in the lecture slide, and I'm going to explain it. Let's just label this axis as speed. This is going to be speed, and this is going to be volumetric flow rate, denoted by V of I, volumetric flow rate. Very good. And what we're going to see is let's just assume, I'm assuming that I'm going to increase the volumetric flow rate. I'm going to turn this faucet here, and by doing that, let's just say I started. The speed was zero. There is no water running through. I'm turning this here, so I'm going to climb on the y-axis, and I'm going also going to climb on the x-axis because I'm going to have fluid uh, gaining velocity here. So I'm going to go up. This is really what's going to happen. The more I turn the faucet, the more speed I'm going to get. Somewhat of a, in, a linear, in a linear way, it's going to happen. The more I turn it, the more speed happens. But at some point, and this also happens if, if let's just, just say I have some sort of carton of milk here. This is, my, this is a really odd way of shaping a carton of milk. Let's just say I have some sort of, I have my carton of milk here, and uh, I'm pouring milk out of the carton. The more I tilt it this way, after a while I'm going to experience some sort of, of turbulent flow. I'm going to experience, I'm going to experience drips or big gulps coming out instead of having a nice clear stream. And what I really mean by this is that after a point, after a point where I really turn this as much as I can, I'm going to get turbulent flow. And in turbulent flow, the speed also increases, but it doesn't increase, and it doesn't increase linearly. What I mean is that, let's just say this point, at this point, uh, this is the point of laminar, uh, the transition from laminar to uh, turbulent. And the more I open, let's say, the faucet, or the more I tilt, tilt the milk cart, I'm going to get more speed, but it's not going to shoot up, it's just going to give me a little more. Speed, the speed is going to increase, but not linearly. And in the, actual, uh, in the actual lecture slide, you can actually see a line here. And this is a linear relationship for the laminar flow. But for the turbulent flow, it's not a linear relationship. It's more of an exponential relationship. So this is explaining this, this whole graph that we, 
may have come across in our lecture slides. So really, when we're talking about laminar flow, the ratio between the volumetric flow rate and the speed is pretty much linear, whereas when we're talking about turbulent flow, the ratio between the volumetric flow rate and the speed is not laminar because we can see it moves off of this line here. Very good. And what's important to understand is that let's just say there's some sort of laminar flow in this tube. Let's just say I'm, I'm inventing a tube here. This is my tube. There's some sort of, of laminar flow here. I'm actually going to make it a little bit smaller. There you go. There's some sort of, uh, of volumetric flow rate here. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to really use the uh, units. There's no, there's no really, there's, there's not a real need for it because what I really have to say is something very simple. You can imagine that if I split this tube, if I split this tube to, let's say, three different tubes, three different tubes, you're going to expect, let's just say, this, this is flowing, let's just say, if I can measure it somehow, it's flowing at 20 kilometers an hour. And again, these are not the units. I'm just going to make it a little bit easier. But then because, because it, it fans out, you can expect that at this point, that at this point, it's going to flow at a much, at a much slower rate than this point. It's going to flow at a much slower rate. But if I take the sum of all of these, I'm going to get the same volumetric flow rate as here. It's going to be the same, really, because I just expanded, I just expanded, you can say, the cross-sectional area. So maybe the speed of the fluid is going to drop here, here, and here compared to here. But the total amount of fluid that is displaced through this cross-section is going to be the same. Because essentially I haven't twisted, I haven't twisted this lever. I haven't really uh, opened it further or less. I just added, I just added, let's just say, a filter here that splits it up to three points. So really, I really haven't messed around with the volumetric flow rate. I just, added, I just added different places where the water can come out. And why am I telling you this? Because we know that in our body we have our aorta, aorta that really splits, splits up and fans out to get to our different bodily compartments. And what I really, what I really want to show you is something that is taken from Professor Gabor's lecture slide, and thank you, Professor. Give credit where credit is due. And really, this depicts something quite interesting. You can see, you can see here that we have the we have the first branch, which is the aorta, and the cross section is so. And you can see, really, let's just let's, let me just take that let me just take that other that other depiction here, and I'm going to copy it here. And really, what I've done, if this is my cross section, let's just say this is my cross section here and I branched it up, I increased the cross-section. So you can see that the further I get away from the heart, the further I get away from the heart, I or will have more, the cross-section is going to be bigger because I'm going to fan out and there's going to be more blood vessels, more and more and more. Obviously, this is where we come, this is the cutoff point where it comes back and it gets, and it gets narrow. But from here to this point, you can see that the cross-section gets bigger. And when the cross-section gets bigger, the velocity would, would lower considerably. So really, this is what this table means. And it's important to understand that here, let's just say this is the aorta. This is the aorta. The flow speed at this point is maximal. And when we fan out, the, the flow speed is lowered. It's considerably lower at these points. And this is what this table is trying to say. When the cross section is, is really small in the beginning, we're going to have quite a fast uh, flow. Uh, I'm not going to say volumetric flow rate because the volumetric flow rate is the same. We're going to have a quicker speed or velocity of flow. So this is what uh, this is the difference between volumetric flow rate and the velocity or the speed of which the the liquid is traveling through. This is what's important to understand the difference. Hopefully, it made sense. All you can really think about is is Volumetric, if I want to change the volumetric flow rate, I need to kind of turn this valve here. But I can change the cross-sectional area. I can increase this cross-sectional area, and this would change the speed or the velocity at which the, this, this uh, fluid is going through. And I'm really not using all these specific units, and I'm kind of interchanging. Obviously, velocity is a vector quantity, and really, I'm quite simplifying here because this is what you need to understand. So we understood what volumetric flow rate. 
what cross section here and what speed of flow is. And we know the volumetric flow rate is not the same as the speed of flow. It's different. And volumetric flow rate is basically the volume of fluid that's being displaced through a cross section unit time. Hopefully it made a little bit more sense. And whenever I'm trying to understand it, I just go to the faucet example and the valve representing the volumetric flow rate. And maybe the filters I'm placing here represent the cross sections. And I know that the more cross sections I'm adding, the lower the speed is going to have when they exit through these, through these filters, so to speak. Hopefully it made a little bit of sense. And now we're moving to Bernoulli's law. And I copied this from Wikipedia. And again, I use Wikipedia solely for the purposes of definitions. I'm going to read it. It's not going to make a whole lot of sense. And I'm going to work to work at, uh, at explaining it. So let's just read it first. Bernoulli's principle states that for an inviscid flow, this is, this is an ideal fluid, ideal, ideal fluid. So for an ideal fluid, this is not really ideal, very good, ideal fluid, an increase in the speed of the fluid occurs simultaneously with decrease in the pressure. Okay, so let's try and understand what this means. And first of all, it's really important to understand that Bernoulli's law is applicable for ideal fluids under laminar flow, laminar flow. You don't really need specifically to remember this, but it's good, it's good to know this because they may ask, does Bernoulli law talk about real fluids? No, it does not. It talks about ideal fluids when they're laminarly flowing. So hopefully I'm going to make this quite, quite easy to understand, and I'm going to use this complicated formula that I took off of uh, Professor Gabor's presentation. I'm going to make it more simple. So, and I'm, I'm going to keep the physics to a minimum, I promise. So let's just say that we have a pressure on this side, a pressure on this side. Let's call this pressure one and pressure two. And there's some sort of different in, in height here, you can say. And I promise, I'm not going to get into the, the entire physics of it. But the basics is that pressure is, pressure is some form of force over, um, force over area. And now what, what, we, what we know to be true is that the, the pressure here has to be equal to the pressure here because ideal fluids are non-compressible. So you can't really push hard on this side and get some fluid to compress. So really the pressure on this side has to be equivalent to the pressure on this side. So pressure one has to be equivalent to pressure two. And why am I bringing this up? Why am I bringing this up? Because here at this point we can see that the pressure is constant and that's what we really mean. That the pressure doesn't change when there's some sort of transition. Very good, we're moving along. And we already, knew, we already mentioned that there's a change in altitude here, and I'm really going to give you an everyday example, an everyday example, and uh, I'm going to talk about water slides. And maybe not, maybe you're not on water slides on a day-to-day -day basis, but let's just say I have a water slide here. This is my water slide, and let's just say, you know what? Let's make it a little bit. Let's make it a little bit bigger. This is my water slide. There you go. This is my water slide, and I'm going to, I'm going to sit right here. And I'm going to wonder, hey, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be coming down. And you can say, hey, this little dude up here, or let's just say this is me. Right now, I have some sort of, you could say, potential energy because I can come down really quick and use this, this altitude or this height that I have. And you, let's just assume that this, this, this slide goes on. So I was sliding from this, from this position here, from this position here to this position here. So I had some sort of speed associated with, with this motion. So when I essentially went from here to here, I had a little bit of speed. Let's just say I was traveling at, at, two, at two kilometers per hour, two kilometers per hour. And you can assume that by the time I get here, I'm going to be, I'm going to be hauling ass. I'm going to be doing maybe, maybe 20. If this is an insanely, <laughs> an insanely steep, long slide. But what happened here? What happened here? Basically, when I moved from this position to this position, I gained some sort of, you can say I gained kinetic energy, but really I'm, I'm, I'm looking at fluids. So I, I gained some speed of fluid or some velocity of, of, of fluid here, but I lost the, the distance here. But if I'm, uh, the, the altitude here, the height, but really if I'm saying that the pressure at this side is equal to the pressure at this side, which is really what I'm saying here, the pressure here is equal to the pressure here, or you could say the pressure at this side is equal to the pressure at this side. What I really mean is that if I take the total pressure that are applicable, let's just say I'm taking 
the total pressure. I'm taking, first of all, the, the pressure that is associated with the flow and the pressure that is associated with the height. And then I have the pressure that is associated with just me sitting on the slide. Even if there's no motion, me sitting on the slide exerts some pressure because maybe I'm a fat ass. Maybe I'm, I'm like 900 kilograms and not like uh, maybe this guy is a little bit slimmer. Maybe he's only 90, so he's more in shape. So really, if I have a really huge person sitting there, he's going to have some sort of effect on the slide, even if he's not in motion. And this is what I'm talking about here. First of all, there's some sort of static, static pressure associated with the fluid inside this medium here. Without any motion, any motion entailed, there's some sort of static pressure. And then there's some sort, there's some sort of dynamic pressure. There's some sort of dynamic pressure that is associated with the movement of that object. And then the hydrostatic pressure, and you may identify this from, phys from physics. This is just the, uh, you can say in physics, it'll be just the weight, the uh, height, the gravitational pull. But really, this is what's associated with the gain of height. So really, if I'm losing, let's just say, and I'm going to simplify this because I like simplifying. Let's say I have A times B equals constant. What does that mean? That means that when this, this thing goes down, if this goes down, this has to go up because it's going to, it's going to give me the same result. So if, if, I'm gaining, if I'm gaining this hydrostatic, so this hydrostatic would go down, maybe the uh, flow speed is going to go down. So really when I'm gaining pressure, my velocity would go down. And let's see if we understand it from this, from this statement here that we have from Wikipedia. States that an increase in the speed of the fluid occurs simultaneously with decrease in the pressure. All right, maybe we're getting there now. So if the, maybe if the pressure is going down, and I know the pressure, speed, I'm just arbitrarily putting here pressure, speed, and obviously this is not physically fully correct. I'm just going to give you an idea of what's going on, some intuition, maybe the hydrostatic the hydrostatic um, factor that affects the altitude that I'm gaining. If it's constant, then when the pressure goes down, the speed would go up, or maybe when the speed goes down, the pressure goes up. And this is what we're really talking about. So really, if I have a quick flow here, I'm going to have a lower pressure. I'm going to have a lower pressure at this point, and we're going to talk where, where the pressure is precisely, but I'm going to have lower pressure. And if there's, let's just say at this point, there's very slow, very slow motion, then the pressure here is going to be way, way more increased. So there's an increase in speed, like here, there's a decrease in pressure. And when there's an increase, or, or a decrease in speed, there's an increase in pressure. So if you want to kind of put it in your mind, and this really helps me to understand. When one goes up, the other one has to go down. But if, if this doesn't make sense to you, uh, my last advice would be, put pressure here and put, let's just say, speed of flow. And again, I'm not using the specific units just not to confuse you. And you can say, this goes up, this goes down. Inversely proportional, this goes down, this goes up. So really, this is inversely proportional. This is really what I mean. Hopefully, and really hopefully, I made the Bernoulli's law sound a little bit uh, more intuitive. I'm not trying to, to solve examples, but if you want to solve examples, I would really encourage you to go to the Khan Academy. Khan Academy, you can Google this. Uh, I believe that Sal has some information there and he goes through some sort of problem solving. But because in biophysics we're not going to do problem solving, we are going to have to understand and answer maybe relation analysis questions or maybe true or false or even fill in the blanks or essay questions about what the Bernoulli law means. This is what I was going for. Hopefully I made this sound a little bit less complicated and I'll see you in the next video.